There we go. Great. So uh, I, if maybe John or somebody can, well, I'll just take questions at the end, I think, and anybody can unmute themselves if they'd like, or just post um, um, questions or comments in the, in the chat. Let me hide my screen so I can see what I'm looking at here. Whoa, okay. So thank you everybody for joining and, and coming to M MHMA's um, speaker series tonight. I'm Gabriella Dilia. And like John said, the Director of Fungal Diversity Survey, also known as Fundus. And I'm excited to talk with you tonight about how your observations can impact fungal conservation. So Fungal Diversity Survey, we conserve fungi and their habitats by actively engaging and inspiring microfiles, people who love fungi like you all, to make scientifically, scientifically valuable contributions, which yes, is possible. We equip community scientists with the tools to document the diversity and distribution of fungi and their habitats in the service of conservation. Over here, you'll see an example of one of our tools that we offer to um, community scientists or mycophiles in the background being a field data slip, which can become very valuable for making high quality observations. So what is community science if you're not familiar with this term? Community science is also known as citizen science, but Fundus prefers to use the term community science as it's a little bit less um, politically inclined. And community science is distributed scientific research voluntarily conducted in whole or in part by amateur or also called pro-am non-professional scientists. So community science um, is, is really uh, a growing field that uses widely available technology found on smartphones or, or in apps that you can download with your phone. Um, it allows volunteers to record and share data in um, a variety of ways. Uh, community science allows experiments and inquiries to run on a more large scale ongoing basis, basis that can advance scientific research uh, with large and diverse data sets that might have been otherwise unavailable without enlisting the help of communities. And community science can improve the transparency and accessibility of scientific research to all participants. And we also typically have a lot of fun when we are out doing community science. Um, there are quite a few innovations that support the growth of mycology community science in particular. Um, fields around the world really are, are um, experiencing change as community science becomes more accessible with, um, with innovations. And in mycology, those innovations look like um, this little list here. So fungal species formerly um, thought to occur across continents are now known to be more like fungal complexes or groups of species, um, I IDs can be enabled by metabarcoding DNA more easily and less expensive than, they, than it had before. Online databases like GBIF or Mycoportal, GenBank, iNaturalist um, have been established making uh, these databases just much more accessible for everybody. And there have been leaps in the, the range of digitization of specimens and observation data on these databases. And then importantly, awareness of the vital ecological roles that fungi play is, is snowballing. Um, and a lot more people are, are finding out how amazing and important fungi are for ecosystems. So um, Fungal Diversity Survey uh, um, began its nonprofit status in 2017 um, as a, a 501c3 under North American Mycoflora Project, if you're familiar with that title. And in 2020, we shifted focuses to looking at rare and threatened um, fungi species uh, for, through crowdsourcing for fungal conservation. So not just all species, but species that are rare or threatened is now our focus. So fundus really, um, there, we, we are trying to fill a gap in biodiversity conservation, which you guess it is is fungi. So just briefly, um, 
discussing, I want to discuss the importance of fungi um, ecologically. As we know, they're essential symbionts with almost all plant species. Um, their fungi are kind of like a keystone species. Um, however, they're kind of more like a keystone kingdom that, have, that has been neglected for, for some time. And so the term keystone species just really means if you took out the species per se, then um, there would be drastic changes to the environment. And if you took out fungi from the planet, um, there would be huge shifts uh, of um, planetary health and ecosystemic um, connection. Fungi are hyperdiverse. There's an estimated two to 12 million species um, at the best estimate. We're not really sure yet how many there could be. Fungi are also poorly known. There are fewer than about 5% of those, of those species that are actually described or have scientific names. Fungi are threatened by the same kind of forces that threatened other organisms like plants and animals, including habitat loss, pollution, over-exploitation, invasive species, uh, climate change, and then um, uniquely with uh, lots of fungi, the decline of symbiotic hosts is a threat. Uh, and the, so the bottom line really with uh, fungi is that they're overlooked. They have been overlooked in conservation strategies and conservation action. Uh, if you're familiar with the state of the world's fungi put together by Q Royal Botanical Gardens, um, if you're not, I recommend looking up that PDF online and giving it a good read. It has wonderful information. But this, um, it, this, uh, um, this is sourced from that, that uh, journal from 2018. Um, they are saying that at least 10% of European macro fungi are threatened with extinction, mainly due to changing land use and increasing nit nitrogen deposition. So Europe has a larger understanding of the baseline of, of fungi biodiversity. Um, they've been studying fungi a little bit longer there than we have here as as um, an organized science effort in North America. So if Europe is estimating about 10% of their macro fungi are threatened with extinction, um, ours are probably undoubted, undoubtedly experiencing some kind of threats as well that we might not just be familiar with yet. So this is one of my favorite uh, images on the right here that I really like sharing with people. Um, the three circles, uh, show the so the gray circles show the estimated um, number of species. So we have animals at the top, fungi, and then plants in the bottom. And inside of each gray circle is a green circle. And so we see that each green circle shows um, a relative size of the number of the described species. And then in comparison with all the space that the gray circles take up, showing the relative size of the number of predicted species. So for instance, at the top, there's about 1.3 million described animal species and still maybe two, or 11, two to 11 million predicted species that we have not described um, or given names to. And this is a large, um, a large difference between what we know of animals and what we don't, mostly because of the of insects that are a lot more cryptic and harder to study. Um, and then if we look at plants down at the bottom, we see that the, um, the difference between the green circle and the gray circle size is a lot less of a difference. It's a lot smaller. The green circle is almost the same size as the gray circle. So this shows that plants, we think there are about 300 to 450,000 predicted species. And we've described or named a good chunk of all of, of most of those, about 307,000 described plant species. Um, this, so plants have been described, um, usually it's a lot easier to describe plant species if you're unfamiliar with a plant, you might see it one day and be able to revisit it when it, when it fruits or when it, when it forms leaves and flowers and you can revisit this plant to be able to identify it. However, with fungi, they're a lot more elusive and might not last for very long when they actually fruit mushrooms. Um, and as we see, there is a very wide, uh, range between the estimated species of fungi that might exist 
the gray circle has kind of a range between the smaller one and the larger one. So there's an estimated 600 to 10 million species predicted for fungi with only about 100,000 described, which is fewer than 5% of the species. So that's a very large difference compared to how many have actually been described for animals, plants, and fungi. We might be losing fungi faster than we can count them. So all fields of mycology can benefit from understanding fungal biodiversity, um, from studying the impacts of climate change and interspecies relationships to knowing the strain that you're cultivating and eating, um, to uh, micro-materials, knowing which, which species are having the most um, effective growth attributes for making things like, like leathers or, or um, packing materials, uh, medicinal species. There have been scientific papers uh, actually published before that are unable to uh, retrieve the species that they were actually using, which calls into question um, the validity of, of the study. So knowing the species you're using uh, is pretty important for, for um, making medicinal claims for it and, and being able to replicate those. Um, and then knowing the species when we're talking about conservation work, ecological work, even foraging and, um, and uh, knowing the species that you're, that you're finding outside. Why community science? So, Put simply, there's, there's just not enough trained professionals, not enough time or not enough funding to, to rely on, you know, they, they do a bunch of great work, all nine professional mycology taxonomists across North America, but um, there's just so much as we have seen that can be done. And if there's already um, people out there in the field with their boots on looking over these, these down logs, um, we might as well add tools to those who are already doing the movement. Um, thriving or declining of species really relies on collecting lots of data from lots of people. And finally, we can build up um, and empower and uh, give more value and conservation and science emphasis to these communities of passionate microfiles who could make an impact. So community scientists um, exist, you know, not only in mycology. Every, you could have community scientists, there's all sorts of projects studying, even, uh, you know, like looking at how um, there was a, a computer program put together for community science, scientist input on um, designing some kind of protein that would be effective for, for combating COVID based off of like an online video game that anybody could just try um, designing proteins in. So community science can be used probably in a limitless way. Um, as an example, community scientists have transformed the protection of birds with eBird. Um, if you have not used eBird, it's, it's a great uh, and very successful um, platform for engaging community scientists um, with birds. On their website, they say eBird is an important resource for land trusts to grow their support and capacity. eBird helps to build capacity by engaging the birding community to collect baseline data on land trust properties where staff resources are often limited. These data are then used to assist with stewardship requirements, inform land prioritization for conservation, and assess management in areas that are key for birds. Um, eBird acts as a pretty inspiring model, um, and if it is possible to do this kind of a thing for birds, uh, it's, it's definitely possible to do this for fungi. There are already, as I've mentioned, swaths of people out there who are interested in finding mushrooms. There are over 324,000 people, at least on iNaturalist alone in North America, who are already documenting fungi. Um, the, I'd like to mention that, so between August of 2021, there, let's see, there were 267,000 observers in August of 2021 of fungi in North America. And just today that has jumped to 324,000 observers. So that's almost, uh, it's about 80,000 new observers just in a few months, um, which is huge growth um, for a whole, a kingdom that's now being more exposed and explored. 
Um, as another example, you're all a part of a mushroom club. Um, you're probably part of, you're probably in multiple mushroom clubs even. I know I am, a lot of us are. So there are over 10,000 people who are even, who are members of a mushroom club who are already going out. Um, and we've learned from our program experience that these, these people who are part of mushroom clubs are probably the first um, group who are going to be turned on to fungal conservation. And they are the ones that we can provide resources with um, the, the easiest way and the, the kind of the, the preliminary resources can be given to them. Um, the main problem with fungal conservation and biodiversity is really a lack of high quality data. So there's a, a large opportunity here where um, community science efforts can be organized and where mycophiles can be engaged to make an impact. And like I mentioned, it's really not that hard to make an impact in, in the grand scheme of things. Fundus has a four tiered engagement model. Um, there are four tiers ranging in levels of um, science, of information value uh, for science. So on the outside of the model of the circle, we see the largest tier, which is document. And then as we work our way into the center of the model, um, those tasks of being of sequence and then voucher and super user become a little more complex. And um, Fundus is really uh, looking at engaging people with um, looking at crowdsourcing fungal documentation and discovery to fill in this gap of, of conservation. And we start by um, employing community scientists with more simple tasks um, like document on the outside. And then we can engage uh, mycophiles. Um, we can involve them in exceedingly more complex tasks uh, if they are interested and we can guide them into that process. So. First, with documents, um, community scientists are, are uh, engaged to make high quality observations, um, which include time stamped geolocated photos that are put on to uh, the internet, most often iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer. Um, two of our programs, the Rare Fungi uh, Challenges and the Biodiversity Database, um, emphasize this documenting aspect. And then sequencing is another, uh, it's another program that Fundus has been focused on for a few years. And as I mentioned, we kind of transitioned from sequencing um, general species to sequencing more um, threatened and rare species in the future. But um, we've had a sequencing program that has made sequencing accessible um, to individuals and clubs at a lower, um, at a low cost or through fundus grants. And then vouchers, if um, you've never heard of vouching, we'll get into that in a little bit, but vouchers are basically um, um, drying and storing and sending in um, specimens to curated fungaria. And what, when they're at curated fungaria, it makes it um, more easy for mycologists, for taxonomists to be able to compare samples and for more um, conservation and ecological work to be done. And then in the middle here, we have super users. So these are people like, um, like our wonderful Sigrid Jacob, who's, who's also a board member of Fungal Diversity Survey, who put together their own, you know, maybe it's like an at-home DIY sequencing lab. Maybe they're starting to teach people how to analyze sequences. Um, maybe they're describing uh, new species. So what we do, looking into our programs, we have our rare fungi challenges, our biodiversity database, and the accessible sequencing program. The fundus rare fungi challenges are, um, exist to to engage mycophiles to try to find rare or threatened fungi species. 
We have a West Coast Rare Fungi Challenge that began in October of 2020. Um, the, the second year of the challenge is continuing now. The West Coast Rare Fungi Challenge um, chose its 20 rare, threatened, or underdocumented species using these criteria. Um, they, they were chosen to cover different habitats, geographies, seasonalities, and form groups. Um, as you can tell, there's all kinds of varieties with color, um, form groups, different kinds of, of um, ecological fungal lifestyles. Um, some are rare, other species might just be poorly documented. And all species are easy to identify without microscopy, which is an important facet for, this, for these challenges for us because we want people to be able to go out into the field and find um, some possibly rare or threatened or underdocumented species. Um, there could be potentially species in the future that you might need to identify with microscopy, but for now, we find it to be an important um, feature of these challenges um, to include mushrooms that aren't too difficult to identify. The West Coast year one um, in, in results from 2020 through the second half of 2021 um, were really encouraging. Uh, out of the 10 initial target species that were set in the first year, seven out of those 10 were found. Um, there were 91 observations by 62 finders. There were 20 vouchers made for all seven of the documented species, which is wonderful. And we got detailed habitat information for 47 observations. There were two major range, range extensions, several new locations documented, and um, there's kind of preliminary uh, possibilities of at least one new species. Three, three out of the 10 species were not found and still haven't been found. And this again is on the West Coast. And these are the Lepiota lidiophila, Romeria purpurissima, and Volveriella erecta. So the West Coast Rare Fungi Challenge is off to the races and um, enjoying its second year. And um, as a part of the relaunching of its second year, we've also included 10 additional species making a list of 20 rare, threatened, or underdocumented species that we are inspiring and encouraging uh, mycophiles to find across the West Coast. So as we wrapped up 2021, I thought it would be interesting to share this little graph of the, um, a, a chart of the rare fungi observations for the West Coast challenge that were made throughout 2021. So you can see that there are 10 out of the 20 species that have been found, um, which, you know, there's 10 more that still haven't been found, which is just an interesting, it's interesting to see how um, the species, what happens with this and to watch it in live, in live time. Um, as you can see, most of these observations, you know, there's like two or maybe eight of the ob eight observations of the species throughout 2021, which um, increases, uh, you know, like a hundred times um, a few of these observations um, uh, numbers. Some of these observation numbers are increased a lot by incentivizing this challenge. Um, however, and, and it's an, another interesting thing to point out that the species like Bondarzui occidentalis you see there has you know 85 observations compared to one or 12. And um, certain species that we put on these challenges are definitely going to be um, perhaps less rare than we thought they were, but um, there's also a uh, good reason to be documenting species that were under-documented before. Um, and then, you know, it gives us more information on the distribution and then species um, tendencies. And it's also an important, it's still important to make observations, even if they're coming in hot off the press uh, in high quantity, um, because with particular species like this one, the Bondarzuia, their hab its habitat um, is rare or declining. So it's important to track um, these baseline data um, and, and create that kind of baseline. So Fundus is so excited to announce our second rare fungi challenge. And of course, we've been focusing on the West. Now we're gonna open it up to the Northeast. 
So the fungus is second rare fungi challenge will be the Northeast rare fungi challenge. And we plan to launch this challenge in summer of 2022. The geographic range um, is, is just distributed throughout the North, Northeast, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, um, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, and then includes a handful of provinces as well. Um, you can get started as you can get started early on. We, we can give you the inside scoop um, by going onto the website and we've posted our, our list of 20 species that we've um, that we've compiled that are rare, threatened, or underdocumented. So if you're looking, if you're itching for something to do throughout the, the Northeast winter, go ahead and start researching those species and planning out uh, their habitats and, and how you can try to go find them throughout the mushroom season this year. So I've included the little list, the list right here. Um, there's again 20 species um, from you know, really rare species that have been found a couple of times to, to species that have handfuls of observations, species of all colors and kinds and, and fungal lifestyles. Um, this Tricholoma grave showed here, um, we were discussing at the beginning of this, this video um, with Bill and a few of us. And um, this, I, this is one of the rare mushrooms that I've been fortunate enough to find myself, which I didn't wasn't, I didn't find it anyway. But um, for those of us, you know, Rick Vanderpool, he, out of the kindness of his heart, brought me to the site of this rare Tricholoma grave, and I got to take a whiff of it myself. And um, it it smells. At, at first, I thought it smelled very pleasant, and then he said, "What? No, give it another whiff." And I had to go underneath, of course, to smell the the gills, and that's that's what was really rancid. That took my breath away. So it's really quite a strong smelling mushroom. Um, and for the record, I, I didn't unearth it to be able to smell it in entirety because Rick wanted to keep the mushroom there to, to collect it during its maturity. Um, so I just got a, got a little little bird's eye view of this Tricholoma grave. Um, as an example, or as a few examples, I'll, I'll just talk about maybe two or three of these species. Um, so this one, in, particular, this Tricholoma grave is near threatened. There's 16 records in North America so far. And if you look up these mushroom species on, IUC, on the IUCN global red list, um, I found it interesting that if, if you read through the species phenology and the species description, there's conservation actions that are also um, posted. And for this species in particular, this is the actual conservation action. It's saying surveys by mycological clubs to confirm its presence to achieve local protection, which is exactly what Fundus is, is organizing. We want people to go out and um, confirm presence of these rare, threatened, or underdocumented species. Amanita rusticii is another species that's on this the rare, the Northeast Rare Challenge list. Um, this is a it's a fun Amanita that is all it's an all white amanita endemic to the northeast um, and it's only been reported from 11 sites uh, this amanita is mycorrhizal however um, high quality observations will not only report on the mushroom itself but will give us valuable information on the mycorrhizal relationships and what kind of habitat it, it is found in this mushroom in particular is that has been found in more residential areas and fragmented suburban areas which is um, unique. The season of the Amanita rusticii is, is mid-July through September. And then this is another example species. Um, is, it's a part of the Northeast Rare Challenge, the Dendrocalibria racemosa. And this species actually grows in the West Coast as well as the Northeast. Um, you can see the distribution map that I put here from GBIF. Uh, this species is a lot more prolific uh, in, in the West Coast. And in our West Coast challenge, we are one of our species is the Dendrocalibia picna ramella, which is a close lookalike to this Dendrocalibia racemosa, but it's even far more rare. And so the Dendrocalibia picna ramella on the West Coast has even like bushier pegs um, that crawl up the stipe. It's a little bit different looking, but it'll be interesting to compare. Um, 
the, the distribution between uh, dendrocalibia species uh, between challenges. So the region for this dendrocalibia racemosa, like I mentioned, um, is in the West Coast as well as the Northeast, but it's a lot more rare in the Northeast. This mushroom, if you've heard of it before, this fungus is actually saprobic and, and oftentimes is found seeing, uh, oftentimes is found fruiting off of other mushroom bodies like Rusula or Lactarius. Um, and the season for this mushroom is late summer through fall. So I am so excited for when all of these rare Northeast fungi species have their own beautiful um, trifold uh, um, descriptions here laid out. And this is something that we're working on as we prepare for the Northeast Challenge to be launched. Um, so all of the 20 species will have their own beautiful um, report here that shows it's their phenology, their distribution, species description, and what to do when you find a species. So all of this will be created for the Northeast species and launched um, early summer of 2022. So keep your eyes out for that. These are really wonderful tools for community scientists to um, look at before they go into the field or these trifold pamphlets can be printed off um, and shared with your friends. So our second fun uh, fungal, di fungal diversity survey program is our biodiversity database. Our biodiversity database is, was created to um, increase the quantity of high quality observations um, and to incentivize mycophiles uh, to, to make, to more easily make these observations. Our biodiversity database is hosted on iNaturalist. I'll go into iNaturalist in just a few minutes if you're unfamiliar with what that is, but essentially iNaturalist is an online database um, for organisms across the board and um, our biodiversity database is a project hosted on iNaturalist. So the biodiversity database aims to address two critical needs common to all conservation work, which is getting reliable data and lots of it. Um, reliable data uh, is, um, so we've, we've made it, we, we've created the database to work more for us um, because by having a, uh, a support system of observers, curators, and identifiers. And so on iNaturalist, it's pretty easy. I'll go back to just put an image, upload your observation of, you know, a mushroom that you can't really even tell is a mushroom or if it's just, you know, like some, some vomit from your dog or, or even like a, <laughs> A, that ran over a pigeon or something. So there are sh a sure amount of poor quality observations that get uploaded to databases like iNaturalist. So the Fundus Biodiversity Database, um, we've crafted it so that we have our own vetting process to help, um, to help maintain the quality of our database. So we have observers, our wonderful observers that uh, contribute their observations to the biodiversity database by just uploading them on iNaturalist and adding their observations to the project. We have our support system of our curators who are fundus volunteers who maintain the quality standards of the database and correspond with observers if there's um, questions or um, if somebody needs help troubleshooting um, something with the database. And then our identifiers um, our trustworthy, uh, high, highly ranked identifiers, we have a team of. So these are volunteers who are very uh, near and dear to the biodiversity databases, um, quality and success, because these identifiers are going around and providing, providing um, IDs or reviewing IDs in the biodiversity database. And so when you, um, upload a, an observation on INAT, you might have noticed a research grade um, um, kind of label that uh, doesn't mean very much necessarily for our biodiversity database. We have our own system of vetting um, high quality observations by using, uh, by relying on our identifiers to help us. So 
if you haven't joined the, the biodiversity database, I highly recommend it. Um, what would you put in the biodiversity database? Well, our database focuses on high quality macro fungi observations and macro fungi can really just be um, defined as fungi that have spore bearing um, structures that are visible to the naked eye. Um, so this includes, you know, puffballs, um, mushrooms, uh, brackets, cup fungi, um, your typical mushrooms. The biodiversity database also accepts high quality observations of taxa that are in the fungi kingdom, including molds, yeast, and glomeromycota, though we don't currently have any, um, any specialists who are identifying these groups. Uh, we will still be collecting them. Unfortunately, the biodiversity database does not accept lichens as um, this has tended to clutter our observations and the people who study lichens, though uh, the people who study lichens are very different from the people who study fungi. And unfortunately on iNaturalist, the taxa, um, the taxon grouping of fungi is included, um, includes lichens. Um, so we've had to we've had to cut out lichens in our database to help our um, our quality of macro fungi um, being being able to be observed as well as identified. Um, we also don't accept slime molds. Slime molds are in the protista kingdom, not the fungus kingdom. So the biodiversity database right now we have over seventy five thousand observations which just happened, I think there were probably two or 300 observations that were added in the past 36 hours. Um, it's pretty interesting to watch this thing grow. The biodiversity database, um, our biodiversity database hosted on iNaturalist can be compared to eBirds database. And as, um, as a framework of inspiration, we can see that eBird has actually written over 300 peer reviewed publications based off of their data. Um, it's exciting to think that our biodiversity database could support our own fungal peer reviewed publications one day. So why should you join the Fundus Biodiversity Database? Well, your observations can be identified by academic mycologists and highly ranked amateur identifiers. If you were to just upload your observation on iNaturalist without uploading it to the to the Fundus Biodiversity Project, um, your observation would probably would more likely get lost and fall um, fall between the seams. But here we have identifiers who are um, going through and vetting IDs. You will also be able to learn about how to create high quality observations. We have resources on the biodiversity database webpage on INAT, as well as on our website, fundus.org. And you're helping scientists and conservationists better understand and protect fungi by increasing information on their distribution, habitat, and seasonality. Joining the Fundus Biodiversity Database is very simple. And if you have not used a naturalist out in the field, I highly recommend um, downloading the app on your smartphone. And once you have that downloaded, you can search for Fundus Biodiversity Database in the projects, and then you just press join project and you are in. And now whenever you upload high quality mushroom observations to iNaturalist, either from your phone or the desktop version of iNaturalist, um, you just have to, you can bulk add them all to the database. There's a feature that we explain on our website if you search bulk add. Um, it's an easy step to be able to add all of your high quality observations. We don't want a ton of um, mediocre quality observations, but the more that you upload to the database and the more that you become involved with Fundus, we hope that you are become much more skilled at making high quality observations. Um, yeah, so if you're unfamiliar with your smartphone um, iNaturalist uh, functions, when you're uploading a, um, an observation, you just wanna make sure that you select the project individually and turn it on and then go back and um, press share observation and you will have successfully shared your observation in the project. 
So um, back to our four-tiered engagement model. Um, now, so I've discussed the ways that community scientists can document fungi and their habitats for conservation and science efforts. And now I'll talk more about our sequencing program. So um, Fundus has had an accessible sequencing program for a few years, and we've really made DNA sequencing accessible to clubs and individuals at a low cost or through Fundus grants. Uh, if you've ever um, submitted any mushrooms to us for sequencing or maybe to another sequencing lab or source, um, these, these tubes here might look familiar and you might, you might also be familiar with the arduous, slow, and I think enjoyable process of, of peeling rice-sized chunks of the mushroom hymenium um, and inserting it in these tiny little tubes. In 2021, I'd like to celebrate that Fundus awarded 930 grants for DNA sequencing, which is a lot. Our, our accessible sequencing program has resulted in thousands of new sequences, including many new species, many species that are rare or new to science. And the accessible sequencing program will mostly go dormant um, as of December, 2021. Um, we've used all of our available funds that were set aside for sequencing. So until new funding sources are unlocked, um, this sequencing program will be um, wrapped up and, uh, and finalized with the sequences that we've gotten in um, in the year 2021. So Fundus has sequenced over 7,000 specimens at this point. And th this is, um, these are some examples of, of fungi species that, are, that could be new to science that um, don't have uh, really strong genetic matches. Um, some professionals think that as many as 10 to 20% of sequenced fungal collections of some taxa in North America could be new to science. Um, that is also a, a really large incentive for many people to want to get their mushrooms sequenced is the possibility of discovering a new species. Um, Another aspect of our conservation programs that has been associated with sequencing are the Fundus local projects. As of now, there are over 200 registered Fundus local projects. Um, I know that there's at least a few in New York and the Hudson Valley area. Um, and I'm project leader for Northern Utah Funga. So these registered Fundus local projects have been a great resource for um, employing kind of a network of, of projects that are studying the diversity, the microdiversity of the region or the funga of the region. And a lot of the uh, clubs or a lot of these projects um, have had the opportunity to submit sequences as a part of the Fundus um, sequence grant program that we made accessible to our projects. And as our grant program um, more so lies dormant in the following year, these Fundus local projects um, are still going and they still have uh, plenty of, of work and fun to do out in the field to document. And we will provide um, resources on our website for um, continuing for, for sequence opportunities and exploring um, how we can still um, provide resources for sequencing and um, strategies for sequencing different labs, different places to send your sequences as we will just be unable to take them for now. Another one of the fundest local projects that I'd like to highlight um, is the Greenwood Fungi Phenology Project hosted in New York City in Central Park. Uh, this is Sigrid Jacob and a few other people's project. Um, and this is an example of a really great, successful Fundus local project. So if you're interested in joining one of these projects or in starting your own, go up to our website and we're still taking um, new project registrations. So uh, 
I would recommend reading this New York Times article. It's amazing. A cemetery's big secret is lots of weird mushrooms. Who would have thought? So these projects are even getting press and, and getting recognized in um, local media, which is wonderful. Um, this project, as an example, in Central Park has uh, totaled over 2,600 observations. And there are probably even more because I took this screenshot a few months ago, which um, is just an incredible thing to be able to share with people, uh, especially in such an urban park. Not that many people might think that there are over 340 species of fungi that grow. So our accessible sequencing program, uh, we've, we've learned a lot about engaging mycophiles and organizing um, sequencing efforts in the past few years. Uh, mostly we've learned that the capacity for guidance and timely feedback to participants is um, something to work toward. Having capacity and infrastructure for sequencing programs um, is, is something that Fundus uh, is seeking in the future. And it actually takes a little bit more infrastructure than we once thought to have um, an efficient and successful uh, sequencing program to us. Um, we've learned that relying on volunteers for administration and tracking specimens isn't always the easiest. Um, but we've, we've been able to analyze many DNA sequences with the help of uh, professional and academic taxonomists and mycologists who we've partnered with. And without their support and without their um, experience, uh, we would have never gotten as far with um, being able to provide feedback to the people who submit their sequences. So into vouchers, vouching specimens. Vouchers are, are just um, dried or des desiccated specimens that are sent in to fungaria. Vouchers ensure long-term scientific value by enabling reproducibility. So mostly taxonomists can refer to the same specimen time and time again. And taxonomists who are studying and who have a lot of experience and knowledge of a particular genus or family can compare samples once they're received in a fungaria. Um, Fundus provides online resources for sourcing fungaria and how to access um, how to access specimens into fungaria. And um, this is kind of another step into, into being engaged in our four-tiered um, engagement model. Over here on the right is what it looks like to uh, use one of our fundus field slips in the field, um, taking a high quality uh, photo that shows a little bit of the habitat and morphological um, features of, of the top side and the underside of the mushroom and some staining um, of this, I think it's a leucopaxillus species. Maybe it's paxillus, I think it's paxillus. And then over here on the bottom is what it looks like when you take home all of your species and organize them and dry them and give them a, a traceable ID number. Um, and once these specimens are dried and organized, um, this is considered uh, what you could vouch this specimen in a in a, an official fungarium. So protecting fungi is really what we're doing all of this for. At the end of the day, when we bring home our baskets and our our heaps of beautiful, strange, unknown mushrooms, um, we want to be able to do something with with what we're taking out of the forest. The end point of fungus is engagement um, strategies and, and um, uh, mission is to provide data on threatened species to nature serve, natural heritage programs, and the IUCN Red List working groups. These are the nature serve and natural heritage programs are, are really North America's um, conservation uh, management uh, programs that are hungry and don't have this kind of fungal data that we can organize and, and feed to them. And then of course the IUCN Red List Working Group is, is an international, um, uh, it's the international um, compendium of, of rare and threatened species um, for land managers 
and conservationists and scientists to use worldwide. The number of species evaluated by that global IUCN red list uh, by kingdom uh, is something I'd like to include here. As we see, the animals have about 83,000 species that have been evaluated by the global red list. Plants, the plant kingdom, has about 58,000 species that have been evaluated um, in their threat status. So this is if something is vulnerable or extinct, uh, these, this red list is what will tell you. And then our friends over here, fungi, they have 450, 450 species have been evaluated, which as we can see is hardly anything compared to the other two kingdoms. Um, the fungi kingdom has been overlooked in conservation efforts for quite a long time. But I think uh, maybe a year ago, this, this list was only around 200 species of fungi. So the, the species list for fungi on the red list, on the IUCN red list is growing. And there are plenty of people who are very um, engaged and, and working on putting species lists outside of fundus um, onto the IUCN red list, community scientists alike. So the future of fundus is something that I am very excited about. Um, and we are really focused on building up our conservation programs uh, for the year ahead. So in order to protect fungi and their habitats across North America, we are developing our rare fungi challenges, um, making, developing a successful model to find rare fungi and their habitats and to incentivize and inspire people to go out and find rare or threatened or underdocumented mushrooms. Um, Fundus is going, is expanding the biodiversity database this year by orders of magnitude. And our accessible sequencing program as it's on hold for now, um, throughout the year, we will explore opportunities um, for possibly for looking into high throughput sequencing, um, other kinds of DNA sequencing that are less expensive, but require kind of larger quantity to be tested. But all of these efforts are going to be um, put toward protecting fungi and their habitats and having um, actionable um, impact, making impact with fungi and their habitats across North America. We love your help and fundus wouldn't have exist, would, wouldn't exist right now without the expansive my communities who, who are interested and who love fungi and who see the importance in conserving them. So you can volunteer with us as a way to help us. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, ranging with from a wide array of skill sets um, that we're always looking for and always kind of adjusting to. Um, you can add your high quality mushroom observations to the biodiversity database hosted on iNaturalist. You can help us by documenting rare fungi on iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer. And you can donate to us. We're always uh, very grateful for, for monetary support, especially as we build up our conservation programs to make an impact this year. And of course, tell your friends, spread the spores, tell your friends that there's gonna be a Northeast Rare Fungi Challenge happening uh, in summer 2022. Get your friends engaged in rare and threatened fungi and how they can help. It all makes a difference. Uh, some of the volunteer opportunities that are open right now uh, are within the biodiversity database. There are manager, curators, and identifier open roles. We are looking for the Funga blog editors, if you like stories and the importance of sharing stories on conservation and fungal biodiversity. Um, we're always looking for people to help with website updating and design. And then um, if you have interest and experience with DNA sequence screening or DNA vetting, we are always looking for those, um, those that help as well. So thank you to the Incredible Fundus team. There's many of us. Um, like I've mentioned, we wouldn't be here without uh, a long list of, of people paving the way ever since the initial meetings in 2011, 2012. 
And if you have any questions, uh, I can take them in the chat right now, or we can open up, we can unmute our mics, but go to fundus.org and you can learn all of all the details about our conservation programs, the rare fungi challenges. Um, I really recommend subscribing to our newsletter. It's only bi-monthly and you can fuse hyphy and stay connected with our, um, with our conservation mission and our conservation programs that way pretty well. You can always email me, Gabriella, and follow us on social media. So thank you. Hey. Yay. Well done, Gabriella. That was wonderful. Yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much for presenting. That was fantastic. It's really great. And um, yeah, delighted, delighted to share that, yeah, the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association already has a uh, project that you can contribute to as well. So when you're uploading on iNaturalist, um, yeah, as Joan mentioned before, we started quite early uh, the Catskill Regional Mycoflora project, which was uh, something that the MHMA started and kind of needs to be renamed now uh, to the Catskill Regional Fundus project, potentially. But yes, it's something that as members of MHMA, we can contribute to. And I'm hoping that a lot of you will want to get excited about this and help to contribute to citizen science. And MHMA is happy to help with that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to say if you're looking into that project, MHMA's Community Science Project, you can find it on the Fundus website by looking under projects and you can either look at a map or look at a, a spreadsheet of all of the projects. And Joan, I think is the project leader for it. Yep. And she's also a wonderful board member of Fundus. So you'll be very engaged if you're a part of that um, um, project. Nice, great. Um, Gabrielle, I'm gonna read a couple of questions from the chat box, if that's okay. And yeah. if other people have questions, you can either type them in the chat box or um, in a moment after I read these questions, you can unmute yourself. Um, but Chris Merrick was wondering um, about Dendrocalibia rasmosa um, and are those little caps on each of the pegs? Yeah, you know, are they, they yeah. are, they are a little cap looking Things. This is this this is a mushroom that has astounded people. They think it's so amazing. I've never seen it in person. Dendrocalibia rosmosa or Pycna ramella. Um, have you, John? No, I haven't. Yeah. I would mm -hmm. love to see it. Like a bucket perfect. list. <laughs> It'd be amazing. The Dendrocalibia Pycna ramella, which is the one with kind of that grows on the west coast, but bushier, yeah. kind of smaller pegs. That is a, a species that's still being described by Christian Schwartz, Schwartz and it's a very it's been found twice, so it's a very rare species. And then this Dendrocalibia rosmosa that grows in the Northeast, uh, I think it has a handful of observations in the Northeast, but you can see that. So yeah, those are all are little caps probing. on the side. Those are those studs coming off the stipe, the main stipe, are those all little caps or those? I mean, I wouldn't call them, I don't think each of like those have a hibernium. Yeah, I don't think oh, each okay. of those have a spore bring for surface. I, I, I heard they were sterile on the side. Of the so they're I, sterile. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess you could morphologically call them kind of cap looking like pinheads almost. Um, right. Out of branch. But I guess they don't make spores. So, gosh, why? Why spend the energy making those? I know. It's pretty fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. And then what? most of these observations are, are found, uh, well, a lot of these observations have been shown to, to be growing from other fruiting bodies like Rusular lactarius as, as like a parasitic saprobic mushroom. So this is a wild one. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think someone needs a, a, an award if they can manage to cultivate this. Mm. I, cultivate. I would cultivate this just for entertainment purposes. You know, you're giving me an idea. Maybe we should have an award for the Dendrocalibia picnoramella on the West Coast because there's it's only been found twice. So we should start rewarding our volunteers with and our observers with like just uh, the bragging bragging rights. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's a question. To you know, to what extent is like successfully cultivating a rare species 
of interest for, for conservation? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I think, you know, it depends on the species and if it can be cultivated, which you could always try and explore, even if it's a mycorrhizal species, but that's a good question um, that I haven't thought much into. Uh, I mean, I would say, you know, before cultivating any kind of species, you want to see how it's like endemically related. So if it's rare in the Northeast and you find it in the Northeast and then you want to start growing it in the West Coast, it's probably not the best idea um, as it's introducing it to some kind of unnatural environment. But yeah, maybe you're the one who finds this Dendrocolibia racemosa and starts to successfully <laughs> cultivate it and study that effect. Sure. Yeah. Even if you don't find it, you might be able to team up with a, or a fungarium. Uh, and if you can even get a teeny itty bitty sample, you might be able to cultivate it. But yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, also, uh, another question is approximately what is the cost per specimen sequence to sequence specimens? Um, it can vary a lot. If the question is asking for what our cost has been for fundus, um, uh, I think it's changed a lot right now. Maybe if Sigrid or Joan's still on here, they might know more than I at this point. But I thought it was about maybe 40 bucks to sequence each specimen. Um, there are different labs and kind of uh, uh, different labs that we that we go, that we share on our website that were, that I think are maybe 25 or 30 bucks per sequence. Yeah, and, and you're starting at 30 bucks. Uh, it's it's not cheap. Yeah, thanks, Sigrid. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, Lee's, Lee has a question of the geographical boundaries of the Catskill Regional Mycoflora Project. Uh, Joan, do you want to handle that? I think it goes up to Albany, out to the Catskills, and down the Hudson Valley. I don't down know Hudson that it goes Valley. all the way. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. down to around New Paltz. It goes yeah. over the other side of the Hudson River a little bit, mm -hmm. not too far over, kind of hanging along the Hudson River over on the Rhinebeck. Uh, Poughkeepsie side mm. uh, all the way up to the Albany area. Yeah. yeah. So Lee, yeah. if you're further up in the Adirondacks, there, I'm sure there's going to be another uh, project up there. And you can sometimes search by region on INAT to find that. Um, yeah. And again, if you uh, just go to the Fundus website and then um, press get started and then join a project, you can view all of our project maps. Map. You can view the projects on a map um, or the project list. And uh, I'm looking right now if there's one on the Adirondacks. And if there's not, then you can you can start a new one. Mm -hmm. John, there is one. Uh, John, I I wonder if Gabriella, if you could put that uh, that rare twenty northeastern list up again, uh, and we could get some local color in here. Yeah. Also, I'm curious, so how often does your does your project have any kind of like organized survey dates throughout the season? In the no. Head zone? no. Could be. You know, if I'm spending more time out there, maybe I could be the one to <laughs> take some groups of people out. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The list of rare species is coming up right now. Okay, here is okay. the list. Yeah, I have been uh, been doing this for forty or fifty years in the Northeast, and uh, this this list here just I mean just to give some local color and uh, mm -hmm. an encouragement. Uh, uh, Winnie is is fa was found right in Poughkeepsie. Uh, I was giving a, a mushroom ID class, so I don't in, in the late seventies or early eighties. And uh, a lawyer brought it in. It was a fresh specimen. He had he was on his way to the class, and he, he in his backyard a squirrel was active, and he, and the squirrel just dug this up. So he brought it in, and uh, and uh, I, I I was able to identify it right on the spot because uh, um, 
Sam Ristich asked uh, Gary Linkoff to put it in the Audubon Guide because he wanted to see, uh, Sam wanted to see how rare it was. And there, I think there are, only, there are probably a dozen or so uh, 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 vouchers of this, but this was one that was very fresh and it, it, uh, it quickly became very important because it, it had a smell very much like uh, uh, a rum and tobacco mixed, really rich, deep, 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 wonderful smell. Awesome. And uh, we know, and, and this, this was a uh, hypogeal, the squirrel had just dug it up. So that was important information. Uh, I didn't take any photographs of that, but it was vouchered. I, I don't know where it is now. I, I think uh, Rick Vanderpool knows where it is. Uh, yeah, un Underwoodia, we've, uh, we've found, uh, Pete Katsaros and I found that, uh, um, either the Northern Catskills or the Southern Adirondacks. Uh, Tricholoma grave, you know, I just gave a talk on that and uh, found hundreds of species of that. Uh, Squamanita umbonata was found over in uh, Connecticut, uh, just across the border in Connecticut. Uh, and again, that was uh, immediately scarfed up and was, was sent to an herbaria. It was during that one of the coma uh, walks over there. Pseudofistulina radicata, I, I, was, I found that um, near the Hudson River, up near Bard College. Uh, it's an old gross uh, uh, oak stand up there, and uh, this was found there. So I have photos of, of some of those. But just, just, this is just, just to show you that, that uh, those of us who've been out for a long time have seen these and have, have, have found them around. Uh, in the past, we used to keep records in, in within the club of what we found on each each walk. Uh, over the years, many of those records have just disappeared. I don't know where they went to, uh, but they they just disappeared. So I think in in the case here, where you're having a, a a method to send them into a central database, that's immensely important and would be immensely valuable. But I just wanted to just just to in in. Uh, say these few things about just a handful of species here, just to let you know that they are around here. These species are definitely right around here, you know, and you'll be able to find them, I, I'm, I'm quite sure, if you know what you're looking for. You know, I think one of the things that's happened recently is that people have gotten very interested in edible mushrooms or, or uh, maybe medical mushrooms or some, or psychological, psychedelic mushrooms, and, they, they, and they've ignored many of the other things that are around. Uh, Pete Katsaros I, I gave me one of the, the wisest words uh, I, I've ever had uh, about this. And he would find a little tiny uh, species, tiny, tiny. And, and he said, you know, this species is just as important as those large glamorous ones. It's just, it has its own identity. And, and that's absolutely true. And, and those of you, maybe none of you know Pete now, he did many of the, the uh, photographs for the, the Audubon Guide. And he was very interested in, uh, in Rushula and also in slime molds uh, and, and was, was immensely important when he was still alive. But he, he treated every specimen he found with utmost respect. It, sometimes it would take him a half an hour to photograph a mushroom mm -hmm. or longer, you know, just it, but that he would set it up. Uh, well, that's that's all I wanted to say about that. Thank you for putting oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bill. Bill. Thank you yeah. so much, Bill, for sharing that because that is like beautiful that you just were able to give your personal input on these rare species for this club and this presentation. So I really appreciate you doing that. Yeah, the, yeah. the Winnia and the Underwoodia. I mean, all those species you mentioned are pretty. Swaminita. Those are uh, unforgettable species as well with with their rarity and what they look like. And yeah, yeah. that's great that you've seen some of them um and thank you for um for supporting such our 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 collection protocol and strategies and then the, the importance of that so thank you yeah you betcha. yeah and and yeah once again if you weren't here earlier bill bill is um the reason why we're here he is uh has founded this club years ago back in the 80s back when like probably before i was born um and is is really just uh, done really amazing work, and uh, very, we're very grateful for. It. And you know, MHMA, it's we're really hoping to get back to that. We're hoping to get back to having solid species surveys on our walks. We're hoping to get back to having a solid newsletter and uh, connecting. And and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so delighted to have Gabriella here is because I would like to you know potentially uh, include some conservation measures within 
uh, within our language and the, with the within the MHMA. And, and I hope we can get back to that. And as well as explore all the facets of fungi from uh, the psychedelia movie to the medicinal to the just what's coming out and, and kind of broaden the horizon of everything that's out there, but also to be making solid observations. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited for you know, this presentation, but I'm also, I'm more excited for how it can inspire us uh, in the future. And, and now Bill has really opened my eyes to the fact that these things are right in our backyard. And uh, just like he said, you know, if you know what you're looking for, and that's why I'm grateful that Fundus is going to be coming out with those trifolds in the Northeast for all the